as everyone this evening. Thank you all for being here online in person. Um, this week's discussion is on Rinzai Shu, or Rinzai Zen. Um, and this is part of our ongoing Intro to East Asian Buddhism series. Uh, we've spent the last couple months going over some of the other new schools of um, Japanese Buddhism originating during the Kamakura period. So this would have been the turn of the 12th century. Uh, 12th, 12th century, 13th, 13th century. Uh, the, so the ending of the Heian era and the dawning of the shogunate power structure created ripe conditions that helped initiate a lot of these new schools that we've been exploring. We went over Pure Land schools, uh, the, this evening will be Rinzai Zen, and next month will be Soto Zen, and the, week, the month after will be Nichiren. And then, that might be it, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that might be the end of the series, or not. Uh, I would still take suggestions. I'm still open to diving in deeper on a subject we've already covered, or going back and covering other things we haven't, because uh, there's certainly we glossed over a lot of other things. So um, let me know. Email, email me. Leave a comment. Uh, but let me know. Uh, anyway, I digress. Uh, Rinzai Zen. So uh, Rinzai does come out of a lineage from China, uh, Chan, uh, and uh, in China, Zen in uh, Japan, meditation as we translate it in English. Uh, these teachings and practices had become increasingly popular during the Song Dynasty uh, in China. And this is 960 to 1279. And, and I make this digression here only because things were really changing in China during this, uh, up, uh, leading up to the Song Dynasty much like uh, we see in Japan during the dawning of the Kamakura period. Because between the middle of the 9th uh, and until the middle of the 10th century, Buddhism was being persecuted. And after the fall of the Tang Dynasty, in the same chunk of time, within about 50 years, there's five different dynasty changes going on. And so with the advent of the Song Dynasty, again, 960, it allowed Buddhist culture to come back onto the rise. But Chinese Buddhism, as we've discussed it several months ago, around the two doctrinal schools, the two practice schools, that is Hua Hen and Tiantai and Chan and Pure Land, uh, those had changed completely. The, only because Chan had become the dominant in the resurgence period after Buddhism's persecution. Much of Tiantai had been overshadowed, if not kind of wiped out by Chan. And one particular form of Chan practice was the Li Ji Zhong, the Lin Ji school, which is just Rinzai in Chinese. And this Lin Ji school was founded during the early Song Dynasty, uh, and all based on the teachings and discourses, um, verses, and various writings, uh, and maybe even some legends around a particular Chan monk named uh, Lin Ji Yixuan. He lived during the late Tang Dynasty, early 9th century. And the Lin Ji school, among a few others, had gained prominence within the Song aristocracy and court. And all of that is to say that that describes the environment that then a Tendai monk, Eisai, found himself uh, when he travels to China to study. Uh, uh, please, and thank you, thank you. Eisai uh, is a fascinating character. Um, I mean, talk about a deeper dive. He's a, it's a whole story in and of itself, um, but he was one who he was the one who brought Lin Ji uh, lineage as Rinzai back to Japan at the end of the 12th century, and he worked to ensure uh, it would continue to influence Japanese Buddhism. And however, in this particular situation, there is a twist because he was never actually looking to create a Rinzai school. Again, a fascinating story. Um, he came from a religious family. Uh, his parents were of um, Shinto priests, and, and yet he becomes a Tendai monk. He studies Mikyo, 
uh, esoteric teachings. And like many others of his contemporaries during the end of the Han era, he felt an unrest in the state of Tendai, and in fact, Buddhism in Japan on the whole. And, and wanting to better understand Tendai, his thought was, oh, I'll go to Mount Tiantai and find and learn more about Tiantai. And so he makes two different trips to China. The first one was in 1168, at the age of 27. His primary goal, again, was to reach Mount Tiantai and study and better learn uh, the roots of Tendai. But what he found was a Chan Monastery when he got to Mount Tiantai. Again, we've mentioned in the past discussions that after Buddhism's persecution and eventual evolution with Chan, many of the original schools of Chinese Buddhism had waned, if not died out. And this is where the, the stories of Korean and Japanese schools were being pivotal in actually reintroducing Chinese Buddhism back into China. Okay, anyway. Um, it makes sense then that Tiantai, during the 12th, uh, 12th century China itself, had changed, if not was completely different. Chan had saturated the market. And here's Isai trying to find something new and exciting and, uh, to save Tendai. His first trip did not last long. It was about six months. Um, and he returns to Japan, and there's a little, there's very little accounting of what of his happenings uh, once he returns, because it's not until 19, 20 years later that he makes his next trip back to China, and in this one he wished to actually go as far west and get to the root of Buddhism and back to India to really to try to learn in this respect, but. Considering Mongol uh, um, occupation of most of Central Asia, that trip did not happen. Uh, he stayed in China, but he ends up studying, training, and inevitably gets initiated in this Linji tradition over the next several years. So he gives this meditation thing a shot, and he has an experience, a Kensho experience. It's a glimpse into the nature of reality. And so needless to say, he's sold on the idea. Meditation had become his tool to his own moment of awakening. And he hoped that, that, would, that this Linzai teaching would become a revitalizer to Tendai's future. He came to consider meditation as a basis of Buddhist practice. Shakyamuni Buddha had done it, Juriya had written the manual on it, and Saicho also uh, highly valued it in his conception of and formation of Tendai. So meditation practice wasn't necessarily new, but it was the Rinzai approach, the perspective, the techniques that were. And it is these that he brings back to Japan eventually in 1191. Therefore, in the end, we can consider that Rinzai Zen was parented by Eisai. But, as everything else in this discussion, that is over overly simplified, um, because he was a Tendai monk. He died as a Tendai monk. He never intended to be anything than that. But he's still considered the founder of Rinzai. He fundamentally, however, wanted to help Tendai from within to change, to adapt to the changing time, society around it, to get with the times. But, as you might imagine, the conservative Tendai establishment was not keen on a whole lot of that change. Um, and so he was run out of Kyoto eventually, after several times trying to make inroads with the establishment of trying to convince the benefits of this particular form of Zen meditation. Inevitably, he's run out, and he heads east um, to the shogunate capital, Kamakura. 
And there, uh, he s soon gains a reputation and, and gets the attention of the shogun of power in, at, at play. Esai needed support. He needed revolutionizers to hear his message. And the shogun needed a form of traditional religious structure with a, a twist that wasn't as establishment. And so it was um, a nice match. Culturally, remember, China's influence um, was back on the rise. And the prospect of learning the newest trend of Chinese Buddhism to the shogunate was very promising. And thus, Aesai's approach was exalted. There's also a whole history about the use of Zen within the samurai training and culture. And that's a whole other part of that history. <coughs> and a whole other discussion for another time, but it shouldn't be overlooked. Swordsmanship, archery, horse riding, martial arts, and so on, were infused with this uh, Rinzai Zen philosophy underpinnings. The massive source of, this massive source from the shogunate um, and, and, and that particular court in Kamakura um, supported Rinzai Shu and instilled it as one of the most, no, the most predominant new school, new school of Buddhism at the time. Again, there was still the establishment. Tendai Shu, Shingon Shu, uh, many of the, much of Nara was still the established power. It was still the dominant. But, as these new trends of Kamakura Buddhism took hold, it still was Rinzai that was out on top. Only because of its use by, and, and infusion within the shogunate power. Over the length of that history with the shogunate and the samurai, these concepts of Zen became pervasive within the popular, popular culture. And examples of which we still see today. Zen comes to pervade so much culturally that, for all intents and purposes, Eisai is credited with the introduction of Zen to Japan. Uh, actually, the reintroduction of Zen to Japan. And there are obviously other schools and trends of Japanese Zen, but for what Eisai did for the future of Japanese culture by bringing more attention to this Zen approach and this reliance upon meditation, concentration, contemplation, numerous aspects of cultural life in Japan were forever changed. Eisai himself, for example, is credited with bringing tea back from China, along with its medicinal use, but even just the aesthetic of how to drink tea and these influences continued. It was not only Eisai that promulgated this form of Zen. Many of the next leaders of Rinzai, uh, what would become Rinzai, were still Tendai monks, even a few Shingon monks, and all contributed in their various ways, eventually, over time, leading to the rise of an individuated Rinzai school of its own. Because up until a lot much later in its, in its formation, it was still still anchored in much of the former established uh, religious roots. And although still very meditation-based, it did incorporate ritual and esotericism and other characteristics of its historical predecessors. And this may have helped it to keep it firmly placed within its use in society. In the subsequent centuries, Chinese Chan monks were also coming to Japan, bringing with them the latest Chinese trends of Chan-influenced culture. Landscaping, Zen gardens, uh, the breaking of stones, I think of bonsai, or flower arrangement, um, poetry, calligraphy, are some examples of how Zen philosophy and perspective bled into so many aspects of Japanese culture. 
one might argue that the Zen aesthetic still pervades and even exemplifies current Japanese style. But really, what makes Rinzai stand out from a generalized Zen is its approach. <clears throat> uh, a major uh, Rinzai focus is on experiencing shunyata, emptiness. E emptiness of autonomy. A, a holy, a sense of holy interdependence. An idea of if I rely on where do I end and something else begins. What is this self and other? This or that? The, this dualistic thinking. The, the idea of opposites. Concepts of dealing... Concepts! <laughs> concepts. And as the tradition goes, focused meditation was a way to bend the mind to experience something past those concepts. However, Rinzai does this through the use of particular techniques. As is with many Chan Zen schools, it was predominantly <coughs> Zazen, sitting meditation. But it did incorporate walking meditation, chanting, work practice, all as ways of engrossing and, and attuning the practitioner to a state, a state where they can purify, cleanse, as we've discussed, to a point where they get a, to a threshold of where it might be more advantageous for a sudden awakening. That those realizations um, can be most notable, uh, can be most uh, demonstrated with uh, Rinzai's use of koan. And it, 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 these are the short phrases uh, as objects of <clears throat> contemplation for the practitioner. The popular one is, what's the hand of one sound, uh, one hand clapping? Um, I might translate it a little differently. I, I, uh, I appreciate it more the, um, there's an idea of when two hands come together, there, there is a sound. What is the sound of one hand? Which is a little, a little different. Um, but point being, either way, these are logically unanswerable and meant to be because their ab ability to bend that logic as means to escape past logic. There, there are hundreds, if not a couple, at least a couple thousands of these. And as such, the Rinzai approach puts an emphasis on solving them, you know, <coughs> experiencing something past them. And, and often that comes in this moment of realization, what they call a Kensho experience. And those experiences are important when validated by a teacher. And therefore, the relationship of student and teacher was also vitally important. The teacher was the one who would qualify the experience that was had. Because it had to be authentic. And this can be rather nuanced. You can't study how to answer a koan. You can't take other people's answers to know how to answer it. You can't go to a search engine to find, you know, <laughs> <laughs> because the answer is often as cryptic as the koan itself. But the answer does somehow reflect the experience of seeing past the koan. The student can offer answers to the teacher, but if the teacher does not get a sense that an authentic experience has been achieved, from the answers given, the student's contemplation upon the koan continues. And it can be weeks, months, years, but all, uh, uh, but all as a way to break through conceptual thinking. Other methods were used to break through this dualistic mind. 
Uh, most commonly, Rinzai is also known for being a little strict. But mostly because in a quiet meditation hall, a teacher might wake up <laughs> as a way to shock or bring about a sudden realization. And rather than the gradual awakening, some foreshadowing for Soto Zen next year, just sitting, just sit. <laughs> Here, the Kensho experience, or the shocks to the senses, these other techniques, were ways to bring about an awakening suddenly. If one lives morally, in equanimity, with compassion, they condition their perspective, their minds, themselves. And it's to best butt up, butt up against that wall, to thin the veil of dukkha, our discontentedness, our, our pain and suffering, the mundane world. And to butt up against it with, while wrestling things that bend the mind in these deep contemplative states, to have a moment. And a true experience of that awakening. I mean, frankly, to me, it sounds, it sounds pretty familiar. Uh, I can see a lot of Tendai influence in, a lot, in, in much of what Rinzai represents. It sounds a lot like Jiri's um, Mo'o Jirguang, the, the Makashikan, the great me uh, meditation and contemplation, the manual on meditation I referenced earlier. It's a description of conduct, a way of calming the mind, and a way of contemplating. It's just that Rinzai style takes a particular approach, emphasizes particular techniques. And that, that, those techniques can be just as useful to us today as it was to medieval Japan. It's a technique, a, a, a way to meditate. It's a way to be. What we have to do as present-day Buddhists, or Tendai Buddhists, is, is to try to approach Zen practice without the numerous stereotypes, tropes, of what we think Zen is to be. I, I was once told by someone who wasn't even Buddhist, I loved it, um, I'm the Zenist guy I know. <laughs> All right. Um, but I think that that idea has come to mean a lot of different things. And it may be a little misleading. And the thing that I got most out of researching Rinzai was it's really about the experience. We can talk about practice all we want. We can talk about theory. We can explore topics in, in this way. But really, working with it, doing it, in order to have an experience that validates the teachings is what becomes most important. In this way, true experience from a Rinzai approach helps us to better look at Zen overall. Instead of getting caught into how we now define it through this different lens that we come at it to come at it with and to really use it as something that can legitimize the practice through the experience thank you so much um, I will before I open it up to questions and comments uh, sensei uh, Ichijima sensei. Ichijima sensei is there also yeah, I, believe, I believe Ichijima sensei joined oh terrific well, I would, I would ask if... if it's Shima-sensei. Ohio goes on us. Ohio goes on us. Good morning. Thank you. Morning. Uh, thank, you. thank you. It's good to see you. Oh, yeah. Nice to see you. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, do you have okay. any thoughts on, on Rinzai Zen, Sensei? Yes. Well, uh, 
very interesting that uh, you know Asai was uh, he introduced uh, Japanese tea as uh, you mentioned. I think uh, you see Rinza, uh, Asai was also one of the uh, lineage founder of Yojo Ryu School, uh, that is esoteric uh, <coughs> movement. And Yojo, or literally speaking, Yo means leaf, and Jo is way, uh, up. And Yojo Ryu uh, is uh, quite, uh, I, I think, uh, almost the same as Ano Ryu, one of the 18 schools of uh, esoteric Buddhism. And also, Eisai uh, <coughs> introduced, uh, uh, you know, uh, of course, tea, how to drink tea, as mentioned. Uh, <coughs> and he used the uh, 18 uh, way of, uh, what shall I say, rituals, that is called Juhachido. Uh, that is how to welcome, uh, you know, uh, people to inside of the tea ceremony. The process of treating a guest that is based upon Juhachido, 18 manas of treatment, how to welcome Buddhas, how to welcome guests to his room and uh, meeting each other very uh, harmoniously. Uh, these traditions really from uh, Mikyo, esoteric Buddhism, as a matter of fact, uh, Eisai was uh, one of the founders of the uh, Yojo Ryu school. That is very important. And that's why he, 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 uh, uh, he mentioned uh, he, himself a Tendai priest, Tendai monk. So that is my comment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Sensei. And again, so good to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Sensei. Uh, I was just going to mention when you when you you're going to talk about Soto Shu next month, but keep in mind that Soto Shu, while um, it was later during the I think it was during the 18th into the 19th or 17th in the 18th century. I'm not sure which which period of time. Up until that time, koan was also used in Soto Shu. The difference was that in Dinzai, it was done during the meditation, and you were supposed to take it off the cushion when you're doing other activities. Whereas in Sotoshu, koan was used only off the cushion, not on the cushion. When you're on the cushion, shikantaza only. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm, I'm actually thinking about doing a, a discussion one evening just on koan practice because there's so many aspects to it that are that are really fascinating. Um, but the so I, I think that, that we characterize Dinzai as being the Koan school and Soto Shu as being Shikantaza school, but recognize that even Koan is not so different from what we're doing with with um, both Shikan uh, with, with uh, um, Shikan practice. It's just contemplation. It's just how it's done. And uh, the big the biggest difference has to do with the koan were actually recorded and the more famous answers were also recorded. So there's a literature of koan. And when you say thousands, tens of thousands of koans exist, and these are well recorded in, in both the, the question and the answer, uh, and they're considered quite instructive. Um, I, I think one month I'll have to do a, a discussion on that. Um, Anyway, so yeah, that, that's all I was going to say is that, is that Rinzai certainly is responsible, Lin Ji, mm -hmm. is responsible for introducing the formal context of koan. But koan is not so different than the Vipassana practice that we do. Thank you so much.